It's time for architecture, coffee, and ding. Hello, this is Hollywood C, and you're listening to Architecture, Coffee, and Ink, a podcast dedicated to introducing concepts, detailing out designs, and tackling the architecture you might not realize the meaning behind. I'm your hostess, and I am here today to start introducing you to the designs that make you wonder why. So I ask you to brew your coffee, grab your sketchbook and pen, and let's begin. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Architecture, Coffee, and Ink. Whether this is your first episode or you are a longtime listener, welcome to the show. It has been storming non-stop on the eastern coast, so if you hear some strong winds or weird noises in the background of this episode, I am so sorry. I am recording this journal lull in the storm, and fingers crossed it will stay quiet throughout the entire time I try to record this episode. It's actually weirdly fitting for the topic, as today we are going to be talking about Stonehenge. Probably all of my generation's favorite subject growing up, Stonehenge has been captivating humans for years. As I wrote in the show notes, This is a break in our New York City art, which we will finish up by the end of January. I will actually release the first half of an episode on Central Park on Friday. Starting next week, we are switching to Monday releases. This is going to be a permanent change moving forward. Tuesdays worked really well for me when I was in school, but not so much anymore. So the new release day will be Mondays, though some of the platforms might take more time than others to update, so I won't give an exact time on Monday. But more importantly, this is the launch of another once a month special. Forever ago, I mentioned starting a segment called Religions of the World, where I would discuss religious architecture sacred landscapes, burial grounds, etc., and spend less time lecturing solely on theology and more on understanding how it applies and manifests in design while throwing in my usual dash of history. Remember, this podcast is dedicated to celebrating all the people and cultures we discuss, so I thought what better way than to kick it off with a topic that has captivated the globe for centuries. When I was growing up, There was always a section on mysteries of the world, and Stonehenge was always front and center in every book fair. My favorite part about this subject is that by the time this episode is released, it will probably already be outdated. Some recent updates about ongoing research have been released as recently as yesterday from when I am recording and writing this episode, changing a major point of our fundamental understanding of Stonehenge. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because you might not know much about the subject or maybe you only know a few facts and tidbits that you might not know or miss. So let's dive into today's episode and learn more about this monument as well as why even those of us in design should learn about this. Let's begin. Let's just remember as always to always check your sources, check your facts, and most importantly, check me. I should never be your only source of information. Stonehenge is at its root a series of stones erected in Salisbury Plains in Wiltshire, England. Managed by English Heritage, a charity that manages a series of historic sites, that's mission is focused on conservation and education of England's history. The surrounding lands are managed by the National Trust. Visitors to Stonehenge have described it to me personally as everything from a spiritual experience, terrifying, awe-inspiring, and a big old pile of rocks. It seems that not everyone walks away from this site experiencing the same thing, and that is both part of its charm and highly reflected in its history. First things first, Stonehenge is not just a series of words thrown together. A hinge actually refers to a specific structure, an earthen work in a circle with a ditch on the inside, which normally surrounds a central circle and has an opening or entrance to the sacred inner space. Basically, imagine drawing two circles, one smaller with one larger around it, and draw a line from the center straight out one side. That path from the outside to the center is basically just slightly wider and level, which allows entrance to the middle, while the two circles dip above and below the rest of the landscape. Stonehenge likewise has an earthen mound and ditch surrounding it. However, it is actually the 
inverse of what normal hinges are. So basically the ditch is on the outside, not the in. The word hinge actually comes from Stonehenge and is believed to be from Old English. Most likely it is currently believed by the English heritage to come from the words for hanging or suspended. The stone part of the name refers to the freestanding man-made columns of stones arranged several rings deep. Unfortunately, this means the site is considered more of an unofficial one, or as they called on their website, a quote, proto-hinge. After all of our New York episodes, I imagine that all of my inkwell designers are very familiar with earthen works or earthen mounds. I do want to clarify that while I'm saying unofficial, I don't want anyone to think the craftsmanship or efforts were subpar. We're going to get into some of the details in a minute, but I noticed when researching and even saw experts, professors, and archaeologists note that sometimes people heard the word proto and think that the builders were lesser or talked down about them, and others think it would have been impossible for them to build such things, that they wouldn't have the knowledge or capability. And I want to go ahead and stop that up front. It's both incredibly rude and rather bigoted. This is a design podcast. If anyone can understand having a prototype, it's us. And moreover, if anyone can understand the importance of an element in one location versus another, again, it's us. And after our episodes on Gobekli Tepe, we know that they would have had the abilities needed to create this. Getting back to the history, this site was built in stages with various levels of completion, we think. And that's going to be a running theme throughout the episode. A large part of the history, the people, and the meaning are still lost to us to this day. So a lot of my research today is going to end in uncertainties and isn't that amazing. This might be my inner nerd showing, but I adore mysteries. I love researching and studying topics and looking for nuances and commonalities. So this is probably one of my favorite topics I got to research. There's so much potential still here for us to learn and observe, and I'm still rooting for this to be like a third century coffee shop. Before I get deep into the history, one thing I was asked to explain was how to understand AD versus BC dates. And this is the best episode to do that as its history spans both. So in this explanation, I need you to picture or draw a line and put zero in the middle. BC or BCE stands for either before common error or before Christ. It goes before zero and gets numbered just like any other negative number in math class. The bigger numbers are the furthest away from zero. On the opposite side of that is the positive numbers, which is where we are. We are steadily counting away from zero. These are common error or, or anno domini, which is a Latin phrase that translates to in the year of our Lord. So any BC date means before zero. So 1000 BC is a thousand years to zero, while AD is after zero or a thousand years AD is a thousand years after zero. Just focus on the A's and the B's so you can see where you are in history. So Stonehenge is really the construction of a series of stone rings taking place over around a thousand five hundred year span to complete. This was broken up into around six stages. Prior to Stonehenge, there's evidence that the site was already important to the hunter gatherers, so they were just continuing continuing to honor the area. Prior to the construction of stones, there was a series of pits that likely would have had posts in the region. While it was originally thought that they had wooden posts, it is now believed after the Stonehenge Riverside Project conducted a study that they would have likely also held stones at one point. This was done by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers and was identified by John Aubrey in 1666. At the bottom of the pit were antler picks which would have been used to dig the pits. These pits were called Aubrey pits after him. There are some 56 pits total. This whole structure was built within a large rectangular complex. It would have been the beginning of the hinge. John Aubrey was one of the first to, to popularize the idea that the site was associated with the Druids in the 17th century. The British Museum currently has a timeline for an exhibit they did stating that, quote, three tree trunks were used during this time period. Additionally, they suggest that evidence has been found to indicate that at one point, this could have been a meeting place for hunter-gatherers, meeting farmers with evidence found from the same time period 
or both lifestyles. What we do know is that in some of these pits and in the surrounding areas, there were burials. So at one point, it did function as a cemetery. We are talking some 214 individuals who have either been cremated or buried that all date to around this stage. While I'm giving a number, I want to go ahead and give it an asterisk or a, some fine print. Not all of the studies done at Stonehenge over the years have been as well documented as they could and the site hasn't exactly been in an isolated environment this entire time while i will get more into it later on we know with 100 percent certainty that people have been found visiting and changing the environment for years so this number of burials is more like the ones we know now and have uncovered next is the construction of the outer rings the most well-known stones at Stonehenge, the Sarsen. These are the largest and the most iconic ones that are included in most photographs. They were two layers deep and were believed to have been added around 2500 BC. They were also built in the most famous arrangement. A sarsen was an upright standing stone made of Cesozoic silicrate. They are arranged in groups of three with two upright standing stones and a third stone laying horizontally balanced on top of the two and the third stone was called a lintel. A group of two sarsens and a lintel together their former unit called a trithelion. The Sarsons were locally sourced some 32 kilometers or 19 Point nine miles away at Mulborough Downs. There were also a set of four station stones standing outside the rest. There's one group of three called the Giant Trilithon, which is the largest stones of the group. Rocks are hard to date because in situations like this, you are really trying to date the time frame it was cut and assembled. At the same time, you do need the age as well as the composition because that is essential to help identify when and where the rock was formed and may lead to either a secondary site or quarry or provide more information about the structure. These sarsens were shaped by being pounded smooth and are laid out systematically in units using an ancient measurement called the long foot. This would be equal to roughly 1.05 feet or 0.322 meters today. The circumference of this area is 300 feet long and each lintel is seven tons and held together by maurice and tendon or dovetail joints in a mimicry of woodworking and some tongue and groove joints. Also around this time period from 2200 to 1700 BCE, this area would have been the center of around a thousand round barrows by this stretch of the Stonehenge Durrington area of the River Avon. The majority of the cremation around this time were adult males. Four stones were placed in a rectangular arrangement outside of the circle, lined up with the solstice axis, along with the great trithelion and blue stone art. Of these four, only two are still standing. Other sarsens were erected in the northeastern entrance, and only the so-called slaughter stone is the sole survivor of that group. Around the same time that this was erected, two other sets of timber rings were as well, some two miles or three kilometers away. One of these rings had a settlement of roughly a thousand houses, and it is currently suspected that they would have been the builders at one point. In the third stage is the construction of the Ceremonial Avenue, which also has a section aligning with the summer solstice. This circle was part of the area now known as the Durrington Walls, and the other circle, the southern, aligns with the winter solstice, giving rise to the theory that all of these sites were built together as part of the major religious complex, or at the very least, were adapted to fit together. Inside those two rings, or technically a ring and a horseshoe in order, are the bluestone. Named for their appearance, especially when wet, they are a mixture of igneous and other rocks. They are often called the smaller stones. They were still massive, just not as big as the outer sarsens. The pattern from the sarsens was repeated with and two stones with one circle and one horseshoe were created. This phase was actually some two to 300 years after the last stage. So there was some significant space and generational gap between each addition. Other than human burials, it seems like altogether, there was no other activity between the first and second stages. These stones also have the most shocking history, as they come from 350 kilometers or 217 
1.4 miles away in Pressalini Hills, Wales. When people refer to the blue stones as small stones, people will mistakenly underestimate exactly how impressive the task the movement of stones is. The large sarsens were around 22 tons, while the smaller stones are around 3,600 kilograms. What's also interesting was that some believe that part of the blue stones were used in another circle, closer to the river, which was dedicated to cremation. Those cremated there would be buried or scattered around Stonehenge. Currently, some believe that once the circle was dismantled, it was incorporated into Stonehenge. The final installment was another series of pits named the Y and Z holes, finishing the official construction of the monument sometime around 15. 1920 BCE. These stones have been important in a recent study conducted in 2008, which came after a 44-year break in digs. It was conducted by Darville and Wainwright, and they had druids come and bless the site before and after the excavation. They, Darville and Wainwright, believe it to be a place of healing. They base that on the bluestones. The area that the stones were taken from has a legend of them being associated with mythical healing abilities. Another basis for their explanation is the existence of someone found who has been nicknamed the Amesbury Archer. He is a man believed to have been around 35 to 45 years old when he died, buried with another family member, likely his son or another close relative, based on some abnormalities on the bones. Basically, some common genetic deformities that would indicate a close relationship. The thing is, he, like many of the others buried there, were not from the region, and he had severe health problems. He had an infected kneecap and destroyed jawbone from an abscessed tooth. He was from the Alps based on tests and the items he was buried with, which could mean he was here on a healing venture. He wasn't the only one who was determined to be from other locations, which to them signified that it could be the end of a journey. Of course, my rebuttal would be it could mean he was an outsider to their culture and not allowed the usual funeral rite, and this whole cemetery was only for those who were considered outsiders to play the devil's advocate for just a moment. But another point in their favor was that the blue stones, they would have been erected around the same time as he lived meaning it is extremely likely he would have come just to see them. People continue to come to the site, and we know this due in no small part to the artifacts found, but also to the graves of people. This next group marks the beginning of Middlework, with a group called the Beakers, named for their pottery, around the year 2400 BCE. After the Bronze Age, people changed it up and created a nearby fort during the Iron Age, though people continued to travel to the stones and make changes even during the Roman Age. We know this due to finding coins and odd bits in much older pits and various other locations, meaning that they were definitely changing something, while the coins themselves only dated back to the 4th century. And it seems like people living around and in the this area continued for most of its history, as construction was occurring from the Neolithic to Bronze Age, and this is a significant chunk of time. And this isn't even the only hinge, much less monument, in the area or across the aisles. Of course, this leads to the most pressing question. Why? Why construct this? How? And who? And truthfully, we still don't know. For every fact we find out, another question pops up, and another rumor pops out of the woodwork. Let's take a second and go over some of the rumors and legends behind the construction. I did spoil some of them by going into the history and construction first, but I believe that focusing on what we do know and working our way through the myths and legends is the best way to go. So the most common myth is that the Druids built it. During my episode on Leap Castle, I first introduced the Druids and explained how there were a lot of misinformation about them. Because just like this monument, we don't have any written documentation about them. We know that this monument was built before the Druids ever existed, as currently it is believed they started around 300 BCE. The Druids being the builders was actually the predominant theory during the 17th and 18th century until the 19th, when they realized that there was bronze tools at the site, which means it was around starting in at least the Bronze Age, and later testing, including radiocarbon dating, basically confirms the history I already went over, meaning it was built way before them. So while they may or may not have come visited or worshipped, they definitely didn't build it. Actually, most historians seem to lean away from them using it due to the few facts we do know about them. But truthfully, never say never. 
Modern day Druids, however, absolutely use this site currently and have for a good chunk of their history. Remember, the original Druids, or the OGs, were written about by Julius Caesar. However, they themselves never wrote anything down that we have found or confirmed. There are multiple fakes and fabricated documentation, but they died out over a thousand years ago and the modern Druids only popped back up some 300 years ago. Academically, they are not considered related. However, religiously, part of the modern day Druids do consider the two as connected, which does cause a bit of friction, unfortunately. Modern day druids celebrate the summer solstice at the site every year. However, they were banned from 1985 until 2000 due to an extremely violent clash with the police. Part of the stones line up with the solstice, which leads to another theory that it was some sort of calendar or planetarium, or even a model of our solar system for aliens or a landing pad. I am actually going to put the idea of it working in some way with astronomy on hold for a moment while I talk through the next idea, which is that it was built for a Roman god of the sky as a place of worship. His name was Caelan. For me, this is just right underneath the idea the, of the original druid. To be totally frank, the location is much older than the Romans, so while they could have utilized it in some capacity, that's not why it was built. Additional ideas include a place of health and healing, a gallows from the Saxon word for hedging. Other ideas include it being the end of a funeral procession, starting at the River Avon and carrying through a nearby monument associated with life, with Stonehenge being at the end and representing death. It has also been considered a computer, a meeting location, and the personification of the afterlife. And of course, one of the most famous myths was that it was actually created by Merlin. The story goes that King Aurelius Ambrosia, King Arthur's uncle, and the brother of Uther had sent armies to retrieve the stones from Ireland to honor the slaughtering of the nobles by the Saxons who were buried on the plains. The stones already existed, having been erected in Ireland by giants who had originally brought them from Africa as they were magical. So the king sent his army to defeat the Irish and bring back the stones. They only succeeded in one and with the Irish defeated returned home empty handed. The king, undeterred by his failure, had Merlin use his magic and bring the stones back to England. And apparently he and his brother were so tied to the monument that both he and Uther were supposedly buried there. Of course, this is all tied to the written words of Geoffrey of, of Monmouth, whose writing of King Arthur was taken as fact for hundreds of years since he wrote them in the 12th century. Others thought that the Saxons and the Danes either built it or had a battle, or even that the devil himself had decided to create the monument. Apparently, the stones were owned by the Irish. In some stories, I read it was a family, but most of the time it was by a woman, and he cheats her out of money by telling her he will pay her for as long as it takes him to move the stones. He instantly moves the stones, meaning it takes him no time and she gets no money, and basically she was cheated out of the deal. The devil then got cocky and wagered that no one would guess the number of stones, and when a clergyman did, he threw one of the stones at him, causing it to dent. It also hit him on the heel, which is where the name heel stone comes from. Another comment brought is how they move the stones themselves. So one theory is that they were actually moved by glaciers, not so much that they happened to leave them built in that shape, but more like the glacier moved them closer to the site and then they were then appropriated for the site by the builders. But recently, we seem to have come to the conclusion that they most likely were moved with tracks across the landscape. The major issue is that we have recorded digs as far back as 1620 by George Villiers, so who knows what has been found and removed thus far. During that dig, he dug an extremely large hole in the very center of the site, looking for treasure. We know that the stones as they are today are not complete and they have been restored and changed several times. That's not to say that they aren't important to history and could provide a lot of answers we didn't even know we were looking for. It's just that since the first proper dig did not occur until 1901 by William Globland, 
Who's to say that Stonehenge couldn't have been multiple different things or all of these things at different times in history? And it seems like the latest round of studies are beginning to think that same way. While it took until 1877 for the first plan to be made of the site by Flinders Marie, we know that the site was already incomplete. For me, I got stuck on the association with Stonehenge as being involved with life and death, the full circle in all aspects. I struggled with the idea of it being a place of healing, as I would have assumed that there would have been more signs of long-term stay than there currently is. And like several articles pointed out, you would expect to see a disproportionately large number of ill and fatally injured buried around it, and they're just are not. It is documented to be one of the largest cemeteries in Britain for its time period, but I believe that the mirroring and inversion of the hinge plays a more important role than has been discussed to the point. The other fact that really stuck out to me is that a gap of 1500 years to build something likely means that regardless of what the original intentions may have been, it likely evolved and changed over time. Most of my primary school classmates couldn't even pass messages without changing details, and you're trying to tell me that countless generations over thousands of years didn't change the purpose of a site renovated multiple times over its history. And this seems to be the general agreement right now in the community. The first remains were there prior to the Blue Stones, and personally, I have a lot of questions and need a bit more documentation on the correlation between the myth of healing and Blue Stones before making the judgment. For some reason, I kept thinking of the stones and the carvings in several different tombs and temples, and noticing similarities in ringing half-formed connections, so I look forward to seeing what researchers and historians come up with next. I could see religious ceremonies, ancestor worship, but I suppose the idea that rings the truth with me is that it would be multiple things for countless generations, with each group passing along stories and forgetting them in equal measure. I can see the architecture evolve as the stones were moved and carved and shaped, and with each new name or picture carved on the stone, it represents not one life but thousands. And for whatever reason it may have been created, if even the final craftsman even knew why it began, it has become so much more. Over the years, we have learned a lot about the proper ways to take care of monuments, but unfortunately that hasn't always been the case. When you visit Stonehenge and take a look at it up close, you might notice that there are some names and some initials carved into the stone. Ironically, that has probably been some of the least damaging things done over the years to the monument. Visitors have been chipping away at the pieces and taking the stones home for years before we realized what a problem this is. Additionally, this area has seen some war, probably more than even we know about, that have caused the stones and landscapes to shift and reshape. It has been the location of multiple festivals that we know about in the 70s and 80s, and given our suspicions of its possible uses, I feel pretty safe in wagering that there have probably been several more that are currently unaccounted for. Of course, traffic, including roads and the way we settle into the landscape, also put the site into jeopardy. In addition to the dangers, of runoff from car pollution seeping into the landscape, noise and vibration can cause damage. And of course, my least favorite culprits, earthworms. Earthworms have been positively identified by Charles Darwin, according to History Extra, to have caused damage to the site. Darwin dug two holes in 1877 looking to study the worms and discovered that apparently they were actually causing the stones to physically sink. As someone who is truly both arachnophobic and not super fond of their buggy friends, this is somehow the most tragic part of this whole episode for me so far. Additionally, while it was believed to have 230 sarsens at one point, right now only some six are currently in place. While it was very likely that the monument was never fully finished, we do know that the Roman and Christian medieval churches used the stones to help build their own places of worship. Of course, I started this topic teasingly mentioning that the monument was in the news as of yesterday, and I am sure by this point you are dying to learn why. So the latest research has been focused on the altar stone. This stone is much bigger than the others in the inner ring. While it is still a blue stone, it recent ongoing efforts have discovered that it contains high levels of barium, which the other stones don't have meaning that it came from a completely different location. Barium is in the second column of the periodic table and is an alkaline earth metal. Barium is a pretty soft metal, 
which is pretty quick to tarnish. It is also pretty distinguishable, so you can check for matching levels in the surroundings and identify where the stones came from. This is one step further for us to understand the site and more importantly, understand those that came before us and maybe, just maybe, understand why they built Stonehenge. Of course, that's not the only news. Currently, there are conversations about hiding the nearby local road, the A303, and placing it in a tunnel underground, allowing the site to be removed from the hustle and bustle of modern life. Of course, others raise concerns that this could accidentally damage the site, causing it to lose its UNESCO status, as warned by UNESCO several times in the past, or accidentally destroy a nearby unknown site. The site, and the 350 nearby monuments and hinges were all designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1986. The new road would go underneath the lands within the official site. The plan was approved in July 2023 after being taken to court multiple times and shot down. The English Heritage currently has an article on the website in support of this movement, and the National Highways has an online article, environmental statement, and reports ongoing surveys to continue evaluating the conditions. Based on their website, it seems the current design would be similar to a wildlife bridge, which would allow for the traffic to pass by underneath, and monument would be well north of it, with the majority of the construction happening on the other side of the existing modern road. That being said, they have an extremely long environmental report that I have been weeding through, and I will also post on the blog later if anyone's interested in taking a look. It's apparently originally some 7,000 pages that they made into a digital format to make it easier to understand. So it takes a hot minute to get through. The Stonehenge Alliance, who are strongly against this plan, cite the need for another solution well outside the historical area or even something that doesn't dig underground and potentially damages untold history. They are currently waiting for judgment in January 2024 on whether or not the plan will go ahead as it went to court again last month in December. When I am recording and releasing this episode, no news has made its way to this side of the pond yet about a decision being reached. If you are interested in learning more or signing the petition, Check out the show notes. If this site loses its UNESCO status, it will be the second one in the UK and would make it the fourth total in history to be delisted. There are several that have been partially delisted or placed on the endangered list, but only three have been officially removed from the UNESCO list. And with that, we conclude this episode on Stonehenge. I will be linking the English Heritage website in the show description. So if you're interested in purchasing tickets or arranging a closer tour, you will have all of the contact information. Again, I am currently not sponsored, but feel free to change that. I just want to be helpful and provide a jumpstart on your own research. I'm currently working on fixing the website, so wait until I let you know via the show or other socials for when that gets completely relaunched. I will also include some kid-friendly sources as I received an email requesting some website for our younger listeners. I will go ahead and suggest on the show check out Nat Geo, that's National Geographic, as they are always one of my first stops for well-written introduction on our, our budding designers and inkwell detectives. Again, not a sponsor, just a genuine recommendation. Hope that helps. As always, please rate, review, and subscribe everywhere you get your podcast from. You can find me on Instagram at Architecture Coffee and Ink. Email the show at architecturecoffeeandink at gmail.com or the blog at architecturecoffeeandink.com. Architecture Coffee and Ink is a Hollywood C Studios LLC production. And I'm excited to meet with all my designers, dreamers, and DIY enthusiasts next time. But in the meantime, may your coffee mugs be full and your inkwells never run dry. <laughs>